Well, hi everyone. This is Bob the Science Guy. Greetings from Northern Michigan. I have a special request for a video from a friend of mine, Craig, and I'm going to address this to him so that he can use it in an upcoming uh, broadcast of his. Craig's a fellow YouTube creator, and he wanted something on the scientific method and the Cavendish experiment. This was done in the late 18th century and helped us determine the density of the Earth and its mass. It's kind of a cool example of scientific method and a very interesting experiment, so I thought I'd give it a shot. So here we go. Lord Henry Cavendish was a rather interesting sort. Not only was he one of the richest men in England at the time, he had some rather unique personality characteristics. He was very painfully shy, and at one time he was going up the stairway in his house and actually encountered one of the maids. He was so taken aback by that and um, uncomfortable with it, he actually built a second stairway that only he would use so that it would never happen again. He was so uncomfortable talking to people that the only way that you could speak with him was to walk into the room that he was in and address the room, and he would then answer the room. He entertained so infrequently and was so eccentric, most of his neighbors thought he was a wizard. Well, the experiment in question was conducted in England in 1797 to 1798. It was designed to measure the weight of the world to allow Cavendish to determine the density of the Earth, which was a great question at the time. Now, spoiler alert, he was able to determine the density of the Earth, and interestingly, it was much closer to that of liquid iron than the rocks of the crust. The Cavendish experiment was the first experiment that I'm aware of that actually indicated that the Earth may have a molten iron core. His result for the weight of the Earth was within 1% of the currently accepted value. The way that we do experiments in science is following something called the scientific method. Now, the scientific method is just that, a method. While there's no particular way of doing it or requirement of a particular step, it does follow some very basic principles. And I'd kind of like to go over those before we show how Cavendish applied those principles to his experiment. Now the first part of scientific method is to actually come up with some sort of a question that you want to answer. Uh, this could be what is the density of the earth in the case of the Cavendish experiment. It could be why birds fly or why the sun rises. The second step is to try and formulate some sort of an explanation for what you think is happening. This is called the hypothesis. Now during the course of formulating your hypothesis, you also want to sit down and figure out the anti-hypothesis or the null result. So for example, if you believe the Earth is curved, the null hypothesis would be, what would we see on a flat Earth? Now sometimes this hypothesis builds on something that we already know. We take advantage of scientific study that came before us and try and expand it. Other times when we're going into new territory, we just simply make a scientific wild guess. But in any event, once we do have an hypothesis, we want to see if we can make a prediction with it. This is what we're going to actually test. Well, in some branches of science, observational studies are the rule. An example would be astronomy. In physics, we can many times do an experiment to try and test the validity of our hypothesis. Now the final step, obviously, is to come to a conclusion. You review the results of your experiments, decide what they mean, and then you present those results to the scientific community for peer review. Now let's see how Cavendish went through this. Now the first step, of course, was to decide what he wanted to test, and that was he wanted to determine the density of the Earth. His hypothesis was that if he could measure the gravitational attraction between two masses of known weight, he could use that information to find the mass of an unknown weight, specifically the mass of the Earth, which would allow him to compute the Earth's density. So let's have a look at how he set up his experiment. So before we get started, let's go ahead and organize our thoughts. The first thing is, he used Newton's universal gravitational law that said the force of gravity is proportionate to the product of the 
the masses divided by the radius squared. Now recall that this says the force of gravity is proportionate to. That's the equivalent of saying that my weight is going to be proportionate to the amount of food I eat. If you want to get exact numbers, you're going to need some sort of a converting constant in there. Now let's take a moment and just look over how he set up his apparatus. This is a modern version of it using a laser. He had a room that he built in his garden shed. The room had walls two feet thick to minimize any changes in temperatures and stop any breezes on this very sensitive setup. Now, what you have here is two large balls made of lead. The ones Cavendish used were about 300 pounds apiece. Now, between them, you have a rod with small weights balanced on the end. Now, there's a couple of things that are very important here. First of all, the center of those small balls and the center of the large balls have to be on the same level so that they are very, they're in the same plane, so to say. Now, the first thing that you do is you hang these up parallel to the ground or level with the ground. Now the reason that you do that is the earth itself has gravity. So what you want is you want gravity pulling down on this entire apparatus in one direction, but you want to test it in a different axis, 90 degrees to that direction. Now the gravity of earth is pulling down equally on all of these objects, so it's essentially canceled out. Now the next thing that you want to do is you want to hang this bar from a torsion wire and you want to allow it to reach equilibrium. So you have it in a position where it is 90 degrees, so equally affected by each of those large balls, and it reaches a point where it just sits there and doesn't move. It's in balance. So once it's in balance and not affected by the large weights, we want to go ahead and introduce our dependent variable, and that is the large weights. Now the way that we're going to do that is without moving the small weights on the bar, we're going to rotate those large weights so that they come up relatively closely to the small weights. In Cavendish's experiment, they were about eight or nine inches apart. Now, what'll happen there is the laser that originally was reflecting back on itself now we'll show that the small weights are twisting a little bit on that torsion wire. And as you can see, that forms an angle between the laser and the outgoing laser beam reflected off that mirror. Cavendish's example, he had telescopes built into the side of the rooms with vernier scales on them so that he could measure very fine differences in the angle once the large balls were brought into approximation with the smaller balls. Now let's put this in motion so that you can see it in action. Watch how the laser uh, starts off shining onto a certain spot on a scale, and then as the large masses are brought close to the smaller masses, the attraction between the two of them causes the lasers to swing. Have a look. Now let's go ahead and see if we can figure out what this twist is showing us. So we're going to go ahead and we've got our torsion wire coming down to a rigid rod. And then it's got two small masses on each end. And again, the force of gravity is going straight down towards the bottom of the page, so it's affecting each side equally. Now, once we have this small weight and torsion wire set up, what we want to do is we want to set it at 90 degrees to the large masses that are on the outside, as we can see here. 
Now by placing the large weights at 90 degrees, we're balancing this apparatus and letting the small torsion rod find its neutral position. This is its home position now. Now once it's had its um, neutral position located, we swing the large heavy masses up next to the small masses we get a gravitational attraction between the small mass and the large mass. That attraction puts a twist in the wire and the wire itself tries to spring back to neutral by resisting that twist. Eventually, after oscillations back and forth, it reaches a neutral position again. Once that occurs, we can actually measure the resultant angle. This is the balance point between the gravitational attraction and the twist in the wire. Now that we understand what we're looking for, let's watch it in action. Notice if we move the large masses away, the small masses return to their neutral position. Okay, now we head back to the kitchen table and we do a little bit of math. The first thing that we have to do is we have to determine what the torsion coefficient of the wire is. Then using the length of the wire, that torsion coefficient, etc., we can figure out how much force is needed to counteract the gravitational attraction between those balls. From that we can determine the gravitational constant, and then by substituting a few terms in here, we can actually weigh the Earth. Now, I've done that in another video, but uh, I don't want to go heavily into the math. The main thing that we wanted to do on this particular video, it was to show how the scientific method was used, how the experiment was set up, and what kind of results it gave. If anybody's very interested in doing that math and having a second video made, that goes through all of this, feel free to leave a comment and if enough people show some interest, I'll go ahead and do another video on it and we'll do the math. Well folks, I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed making it for you. Please take a moment to like and subscribe to this channel and request notifications of upcoming videos. This is Bob the Science Guy and thank you for stopping by.